So what type of problems did you see in Christianity and in the Bible that ultimately led you to Islam? I'll try and speak now in terms of what scholarship says, what historians have discovered. It seems to me that Jesus didn't preach Christianity. He didn't come to found a church. For example, none of the Gospels, apart from one, speak of Jesus talking about a church at all. The earliest Gospels don't have Jesus speaking of a church at all. And he doesn't preach Christianity. What he preaches is God. He preaches Tawhid, and he's against hypocrisy. He preaches Nia, sincerity, uh, and the love of God and love of neighbor, and so on. So it's kind of like a renewal movement. It's a spiritual renewal movement within Judaism. So Jesus' faith, if you like, we would call that Judaism, or the faith of the Israelites. He didn't preach the Incarnation. He didn't preach the Trinity. He didn't preach the Atonement, according to the vast majority of historians. The problem for Christianity is in the idea that God became a man in Jesus. This is a late idea. It's not there in Jesus' ministry. It's only found, actually, in the Gospel of John. This is the last Gospel to be written. In the earlier Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mark's the earliest, there's no incarnation at all, and that's the least historical gospel of all, and that's the gospel of John. Only in one place in the gospels does Jesus walk around saying, I am the light of the world, or before Abraham was, I am, or I am the resurrection of the life, or I am the light of the world. All these I am statements are only found in one gospel, the last gospel of John. If you look at the early gospels, Jesus never speaks like this. He speaks about God. He speaks about um, repentance. God is someone other than Jesus. He's not the message. God is the message. He's the messenger. He's the prophet, for sure. But he is not God. In John, it gets a bit more difficult, uh, more complicated. Jesus comes across as a somewhat divine figure. In the beginning was the Word, the Gospel begins, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, etc. Now, all of this is very late, and if Jesus actually went around saying these amazing things that John claims he did, why did no one else report that? So we have an earlier gospel, the Gospel of Luke, for example. In the entire Gospel of Luke, Jesus never speaks like that. He never speaks about himself so much. It's about God. He just doesn't call himself God. He's just a prophet. And he never says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So uh, the bad news is the Gospel of John is used by Christians more than any other gospel to preach. For example, the American evangelist who I saw in London some years ago, he said, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And you know, his scholars will say, no, he probably didn't say that. So that's not historical. And this is the scandal Christians generally don't know about what their own scholars are saying about this. That's worrying because how can you trust them now if they contain made up stories? There are made up stories in the Gospels. So uh, this can shake your faith. And if Jesus didn't preach the Trinity, if he didn't believe he was the incarnate son of God, I, I would have found that threatening as a Christian. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was, you know, the early historical Jesus, for example, or the reliability of the Gospels. Uh, and, and that's not based on skepticism. That's based on, but what's the evidence? And the evidence often is not there for their reliability, and that was a problem. What other answers did you find in Islam that you couldn't find in Christianity? Can you give us more details? Some answers to some profound questions that still baffle Christian theologians and bishops of the highest order. For example, the problem of suffering, the problem of evil in the world. Christians basically have this idea that God is very, very loving. And you think, well, why are people dying of cancer? What about earthquakes? I actually heard the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, talking about this, and he has no answers. It's for, I find that frustrating because if only, I mean, I don't mind if he nicks it from the Quran. I mean, there are answers in Islam to these, real answers to do with the nature of our life on earth and the character of God and the life being a test and a trial and the afterlife and the reward. So many answers. But Christians don't use any of this material. I mean, I wouldn't mind if they just borrowed it, you know. But there are also other answers to problems about who was Jesus. Who was Jesus, according to Western scholars? He thought he was a prophet. Okay, well, that's what the Quran teaches. What else? He thought he was the Messiah. The Quran teaches that. He did not think he was God. The Quran teaches that. He did not teach the Trinity. He did not teach the Incarnation. He did not teach the... He did not found a church, actually, according to historians. And Muslims don't believe he founded the Catholic Church. So there's incredible convergence between the latest Western scholarship is saying about Jesus and what the Quran is also saying 
about Jesus. And I think that's a miracle of the Quran, which is often not spoken of. We talk about the miracles of the Quran, of course there are many. This is all, for me, this is another one. What other evidences can you give that refute the core beliefs of Christianity? Let's deal with the atonement first. And I'm going to give one version of how it's understood by Christians. Many Christians will tell you, Jesus was God, okay? And he died for your sins. I think, hmm, that's interesting. So you're telling me that God died for my sins. I have a problem. According to the Bible, it says God is immortal. And yet you believe that Jesus died for my sins. And they say, oh, well, 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 okay. God didn't die, but the human being died. The man, Jesus, died for your sins. So, ah, well, that's interesting. So you're telling me that you believe in human sacrifice and that's the way to be a reconciled to God. That's the atonement. Well, oh, it's not really human sacrifice. Well, it is because Jesus was a human being. He was a sacrifice for your sin. That's what you just said. Jesus didn't go around preaching human sacrifice. He preached the God who was merciful and loving. So that would be one problem. The other the problem with the Trinity, the two problems, one is Jesus never taught it. It wasn't believed by his disciples. So that's a big problem for me. But secondly, they say that God is one, but the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So there are three, but they are one. And I'm saying, hey, oh, whoa, 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 back up. So how can the Father be fully God, the Son be fully God, and the Holy Spirit be fully God, and yet there be one God? You've just said there are three gods. The idea of the Trinity evolved very slowly over several centuries. So first you had the idea there was God, God the Father, and then the issue was, well, who is Jesus in relation to God? And in the second century, particularly, you had the idea that Jesus and God were somehow um, in relationship, that, that, that God was God, but somehow Jesus was divine in some sense. But it was only really in the third century at the Council of Nicaea in, in Turkey, only at the Council of Nicaea was it officially decided by the bishops under Constantine, the emperor, that the son and the father were co-equal. They, they had the same substance, or in Greek, homo usion. Homo meaning the same, and usia meaning substance. So the son and the father were the same substance. In other words, Jesus was God. People often say Nicaea was about the Trinity. It wasn't. The Council of Nicaea doesn't mention the Trinity. That came later in the Council of Chalcedon and Constantinople. At Nicaea, they talked about the relationship between the Son and the Father. And the only Trinitarian verse in the Bible, because there was one, is fake. It was added in later. And we know this. It's 1 John 5, 7. If you look in your modern Bibles, most modern Bibles have now taken it out. But this says there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit, meaning the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But this is a made-up verse that everyone now, apart from fundamentalists, agrees was added to the Bible. If you remove that Trinity verse, which all scholars do, there is nothing in the Bible that speaks about the Trinity. You said that the Gospel writers are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who are they? Do we have any historical records of these people or are they anonymous? The four Gospels are anonymous, as you correctly say. You get the Gospel of Matthew, for example, the first one in the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament. It never says that it's by who, who, who it's by. Christians I speak to don't agree with me on that. So I say, okay, I'll wait. Give me a passage in any of the Gospels where it says a name of a person who wrote them. Oh yeah, yeah, it does, it does. It says it in John's Gospel. Fine, I'll wait. Here's your Bible. Show me where it says it. So I wait. And I usually give them two minutes because, you know, I've got things to do with my life, you know. And I always know, because it's a game of chess, that they're going to come back and say, and they change the subject. They just change the subject because it doesn't say in John anywhere a named person who wrote it. It's simply not there. But they believe it is because that's what they've been told. Despite having such baseless scriptures and belief systems, why do so many people still continue to follow Christianity? Well, that's easy because they have no idea that this is a problem. Many Christians are educated people. They might have a degree in chemistry, accountancy, media studies, whatever, you know? They're not stupid, far from it. But the way the churches teach the faith to them, they don't teach them an advanced understanding of their own scriptures. Now, the priests and pastors and ministers who teach them or preach at them are trained in universities. They know, say, the Gospel of John is the least historical of the four Gospels. They know that because they've been taught it. So how come the people in the pew don't know? And many reasons have been given. Bart Ehrman, the American academic, has, has discussed this. Some priests don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to teach their faithful. By the way, your Bible 
it's not as what you might think it is. Or they don't want to upset their Christian people. They don't want to disturb them. Or maybe they don't know how to communicate it. Or maybe they're just running away. But whatever the reason is, they're not doing it usually at all. So for me, this is the scandal of Christianity. Or maybe they do know, but and they live in this kind of, like I did as a Christian for a long time, this kind of, you believe, but you have big doubts. And you just carry on anyway, because what else is there to do? If Christianity is not true, then why do some Christians find peace when they become more serious about their faith? Christianity is mostly true. What do I mean by that? I mean, Christians believe in one God. I know we've spoken about the Trinity, but they believe in one God, they think. They believe in angels. They believe in the Day of Judgment. They believe God created the heavens and earth. They believe that God sent Moses and all the prophets, etc., etc. It's like an iceberg. You know, there's a massive under the waterline thing that they believe, which we also believe as Muslims. It's just the bit on top. I mean, it's not a small bit, it's an important bit, um, about the Trinity and the Incarnation and Atonement, which we don't agree on. So it's not as if Christianity is all false. So it's more complicated than that. And I think many Christians, when they pray to God, just pray to the Father. Actually, I've heard many Christians say that. They're not quite sure about Jesus. They might officially believe he's God, but in practice, they pray to God the Father. So they're functionally Unitarian, they, they, uh, by which I mean they believe in the oneness of God rather than Jesus. They behave quite often like people who are more in line with Islam in practice. So I, I think many of them find peace because there really is peace. I mean, if we believe, uh, as I do anyway, that God is merciful and he, he does try to guide people, even from other religions, towards the truth, even within that faith, away from shirk, for example, I believe that because I believe God cares about people.